Well, good morning from me and a welcome. In case you're new here or in case you're joining us for the first time online, my name is Esther. I'm one of the pastors here. My pleasure to extend my welcome also to you here today, and especially if it's your first time, if you're visiting us, if you're just with us because it's a summer a Sunday and you're doing something different, well, we are delighted to have you with us. And our heart's desire is that the Lord would minister deeply and powerfully to you through the worship and through his word to you today. And it's my privilege to open the word with us. And you're joining us today, it's week four of our summer series entitled Heart After God, lessons from the life of David. We're looking at David, this overlooked shepherd boy, which is kind of where he started off, who learned to trust God, who became known as a man after God's own heart and was anointed to be king over Israel. And really, he opened up and established the kingdom that God was building on the earth more than anyone before him had done. In fact, in the 80 years that kind of were David's rule and then the rule of his son Solomon, Israel experienced something of a golden age of peace and prosperity and renown among the nations. So something David did was seriously right and seriously good. Now, of course, David wasn't without fault or flaw. He made mistakes as well. We're going to hear a bit more about that in a couple of weeks' time. But nevertheless, David was a man after God's own heart. He desired God. He pursued God. He was honest with God. We see that in the Psalms. And he seemed to walk in a proximity to God that looks more like the intimacy we have opened up to us through Jesus than what was commonly understood and experienced by those living under the old covenant. He was a kingdom bringer even before Jesus had come to officially inaugurate his kingdom on the earth. David embodies and epitomizes how we see the work of God through the Old Testament, looking forward to the fulfillment that will come in Jesus. It's why the Old Testament is so important for us to have the full picture. And there's much that we can learn from the life of David for us here today in 2023. Now, of course, if you've been tracking with us, you'll know Tracy introduced us to David in our first week as he was called in from the fields and the sheep by the prophet Samuel, who'd been sent to anoint a new king. And she unpacked for us the qualities of David's heart that made it a heart after God's own heart. Great acronym, Tracy. We love that. Uh, we heard in week two about David uh, facing Goliath and showing us, helping us understand that when we know God and we trust in God, we can face our giants and we can overcome them. And last week we heard from Mark, just brilliant teaching around uh, David and his time of waiting from being called and anointed to then a long time later, really, stepping into the fullness of what God had called him to do and how the time of waiting served to really continue to shape David's heart. And if you've missed any of those, then you can catch up on CLM Church's YouTube or you can find the podcast of those on SoundCloud or by clicking the resources tab on the website. Our title today is Present Central. Present central, as we consider the next stage of David's life, we're going to pick up in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles, and how this man with a heart after God's own heart carried a passion for the presence of God. You know, when you love someone, you have a heightened awareness of their presence. If you've ever been romantically interested in anybody, you will maybe have experienced this. Don't all look blankly at me. I know some of you will have experienced this. I can remember, perhaps with a little embarrassment now, a young adult's weekend away 28 years ago. I was fairly new to the church that I was part of, but I'd begun to find myself perhaps unhelpfully interested in the young man leading the group. And I was <laughs> attentive as to whether he was present or not. In fact, I couldn't help but clock where he was, and I wanted to be in his proximity. But of course, I didn't want that to seem obvious. I didn't want anyone to notice that. I didn't know if he liked me. You're trying to, you know, you probably play it cool. But on this weekend away, literally every mealtime, I'd go into the hall where the meals were, and I was aware of where he was. But you don't want to make it obvious, but I wanted to be at the same table. So, you know, you're, the different strategies, like sometimes you're hanging back, saying, okay, let's just see where everyone goes. 
now, if I move now. <laughs> other times there may have been a little bit of man managing how other people uh, approach tables where they say, I know some people might call that manipulation. I call it strategy, okay, <laughs> strategy. But the truth was that weekend away, every meal time, I sat at the same table as him. And I don't think I gave anything away. <laughs> you see, the truth is, I know that's not what you came to church to hear about this morning. And here we are 26 years later, 28 years later, married, leading a church together. Thank you. Yeah. I share that slightly embarrassing story just to give us this idea, this picture that actually, when you love someone, their presence matters. When you love someone, their presence is important to you. When you love someone, you want to be in their presence. David had a heart after God. He loved God. And he'd learned that God was present, not just omnipresent, as in everywhere, simply because he's God, but manifestly present, that he manifests his presence. He comes close to people to encounter them, to reveal himself to them. His tangible presence can be felt and can be experienced. Some of our guys were talking about that on that video, encounters that they've had. It can be different for different ones of us or different on different days. Sometimes it can feel like the peace of God. Sometimes it can be more of a power encounter or maybe a deep sense of being loved or made clean. Perhaps a feeling of being home or safe. Sometimes when we encounter the presence of God, we get a sense of his greatness or goodness or kindness or majesty or sometimes a sense of his holiness. That way we can somehow feel at the same time exposed and yet loved and accepted as he shines a light into our hearts. David was passionate for the presence of God, passionate about the presence of God. We see this in the Psalms. If you're a reader of the Psalms, the po some of the poetry of the Old Testament, numbers of them were written by David. He writes this in Psalm 63. We've already heard the words today. God, you're my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. David had encountered something of the presence of God, of his power, of his glory, of his love, so much that he said, this is actually better than life itself. He says in Psalm 23, a familiar psalm to many of us, the Lord is my shepherd. At one point he says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. He'd understood and he'd experienced something of the presence of God. He'd fought with lions and bears out in the field with the sheep and he'd found that the Lord was with him in a way that removed or helped him overcome his fear. In Psalm 51 verse 11, when, conf when confronted about his own sinful choices and behavior, his prayer in that moment is, in verse 11, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. David's concern in this moment, he's going to lose his connection with the presence of God that was so, so precious to him. So I hope we can see in David's life personally, this is a man who is passionate about the presence of God. He desired it. It was a reality for him. He lived and he sought to live in presence central. It was a key priority. He noticed the presence, he was attentive to it because he loved God. And where we're gonna pick up with David in his story today is really building on this personal priority of him. But before we dive right into that, I wonder if we might even just pause and ask ourselves this morning, how passionate am I for the presence of God? Is his presence central in my life? And if it isn't, what is central at the moment? What is in its place? Perhaps there are some things for all of us that maybe need reordering in our lives. And so even as we unpack the word this morning, Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak into these things in our lives and in our hearts. And we ask that your grace would encounter us again, fill us with your presence. Take the central place and help us to see 
the small steps that we need to take. Amen. You see, of course, there are practical things that we can do in our lives to help us to keep God's presence central. Simple things, but not always easy. To make time to be still, to be quiet, to be alone, to switch your phone off. Ouch. We're not very good at it, are we? Switching the phone off or just leaving it in another room. Praying, talking to God. Praising and worshiping, making time for those things which help us to find a place of encounter. I often use as part of my devotional time the Lectio 24-7 app. I know some of you also use it. And they begin every day with this really simple prayer. And it says this, as I enter prayer now, I pause to be still, to breathe slowly, to recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God. Simple words, a simple practice, but so helpful in our busy, noisy world with so many things that demand our attention. So many people investing massive amounts of money to get your attention and to keep you engaged elsewhere. And all of us need a daily rhythm that's going to help us to come back to keep God's presence central. And it will probably help us all to think, even today, what's the thing I need to do? What's the thing I need to do this week? But for David, personally, he was on with this. He kept God's presence central. And we're going to now pick up with the wind. Don't worry, that wasn't just a massively long introduction. That is a decent chunk of the sermon that I'm going to bring today, in case you're feeling alarmed. As we pick up the story from where we were last week, David had been anointed but was waiting. Saul was still the king, but eventually Saul does die. You can read that 1 Samuel chapter 31. And it's not entirely straightforward how David comes to be king. It's a little bit slow. It comes in, in kind of chunks, one not all together. There's this gradual process, but David does actually step in to do the thing that he has been called and anointed to do. He becomes king. He steps into this role of incredible leadership and influence over God's people. And perhaps you can guess from my introduction what his first priority was. And perhaps this is particularly significant for us to learn from as a church in a season of maturity and multiplication as we sense the Lord calling and positioning us into a new place of influence. What should the priority be? You see, what David does is he seeks to make room for the presence of God beyond his own heart, beyond his own life personally, but to bring it into the life of the nation of Israel of which he is now king. And as he becomes established in his role, he comes and he seeks to put God's presence central. And all of this in his era has to do with the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant, just in case you don't know what that was, it existed because of God's heart to dwell in the middle of his people. I think we've got an image here just to give you a sense of maybe what it was. It was essentially an ornate wooden box that was uh, covered with gold. It had been put together under God's instruction under the leadership of Moses. Inside it were the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments and a couple of other things, a kind of iconic items from Israel's journey. Where the ark was, God's presence and glory were. It looked like cloud in the day and it looked like fire at night. There was a visible, tangible presence of God that was positioned in and around the ark. The Israelites, historically, they literally camped around the tent that housed the ark and the glory of God. And Exodus and Numbers, those books in the Old Testament, they explain how the Israelites literally lived with the ark and the presence central. But by David's time, Israel had uh, entered and taken possession of a land. They were no longer a wandering people, but they were settled. And they had this tabernacle, the tent which housed the ark. It was in a place called Shiloh. The integrity of the priests and the people around living with the presence had been lost. And in battle one day with the Philistines, some Israelite soldiers under fierce pressure sent for the ark to be brought out into the battlefield, which was never how it was meant to happen, just to see if it would help them win. They carried it out a bit like a lucky charm, a bit like we can do sometimes if we've not been walking very close to God, and then we get under extreme pressure and we go, where is my Bible? I don't know where I last had it. Let's go and find it. Let's brush the dust off. Let's see if it makes a difference. 
It will if we keep reading it, but it may not if we just bring it into the room in a superstitious manner. And instead of saving them, the ark was captured and the Philistine army carried it off. But it caused them all sorts of problems because they didn't know how to handle it or to deal with it. And there were tumors and deaths. There was so much going on. The Philistine says, we have got to get rid of this thing. And they actually ended up putting a couple of cows on a cart and getting this uh, ark and just sent it off in the direction of Israel. And they said, if it makes it there, we'll know it was actually God. And sure enough, it makes its way back to Israel, to a place called Beth Shemesh. And the people accept it with joy, but then they kind of get it off. They're looking in it, and everyone who looks in it dies. And not surprisingly, the people are terrified. They're like, they go to the next village, like, Kiriath Jerim, can you send some people? Just get this thing out of our town. We don't want it here. They were terrified. And these people from Kiriath Jerim, they come and they take it. And it gets taken to the house of someone called Abinadab. Can I hear you say Abinadab? Abinadab. And do you know how long it stayed in Abinadab's house? 20 years. I don't know where he kept it. I don't know if he had a big house. I don't know how that worked out. But for the whole rule of Saul as king, for all of that time, there it stayed. And that's where we pick up the story in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 3. We're just going to read a few bits here to see what David does. So this is uh, verse 3. David speaking to an assembly of Israel. He said, let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. And the whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. So David assembled all Israel from the Shihor River in Egypt to Lebo Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. David and all Israel went to Kiriath Jerim to bring up from there the ark of God the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim, the ark that is called by the name. They moved the ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart, with Uzzah and Ahio guiding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God, with songs and harps, lyres, timbrels, cymbals, and trumpets. When they came to the threshing floor of Kaidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he'd put his hand on the ark. So he died there before God. And then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day and asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God to me? And he did not take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obadidim the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained with the family of Obadidim in his house for three months. And the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. What an account. Slightly uncomfortable reading. You come away thinking, God, you are holy. You are mighty. You are perhaps to be feared more than we do. I can also only think, Obadidah must have been a fairly um, unpopular person. They're thinking, okay, if someone's expendable, who's the next person to go? If we're going to send this thing somewhere, let's send it to the house of Obadid and the Gittite. We don't mind if he's the next one in line. And I guess he and his household must have been terrified as it came towards them. The king has sent it. You can't refuse it. But you see, David, he had a passion to bring God's presence central, but his first attempt went horribly wrong. I don't know if you've ever had a first attempt at something that's gone horribly wrong. I began to think about this to see if I had an example, and I had so many, I had to end trouble choosing which one to share with you this morning. But I did want to talk to you for a moment about driving tests. Now, I wonder if you can just show your hand. If you've passed first time, just raise a hand. Yeah, I want to say, yeah, you're brilliant. Well done. Can we applaud those people? First time, yeah, that's great. You're obviously way better drivers, all that stuff. But for some of us, it didn't go so well, okay? For some of us, the first attempt was a little bit harder. In fact, I don't know, anyone willing to say it's either taken or is taking more than one attempt to pass a driving test? Okay, small handful of us, thank you for your honesty. And I need you to know, I feel your pain. I still feel your pain, as you can probably tell. You can feel it too, right to the back of the room. You see, on my first, uh, first test, I was so nervous. 
I was so nervous. Uh, my instructor thought I was ready, but I was so nervous about the whole like, practical exam thing. And something happened to me in my test that actually has never happened before or since in 25 years of driving. We had to do this thing back then called reversing round a corner. And uh, you know, you had to line up, get right round. Now, admittedly, I got my angle slightly wrong. I've got to admit that, take responsibility. But I didn't actually just kind of clip the curb or something like that. I actually managed to uh, wedge the back tire of the car against the pavement in such a way that the car would not move forwards or backwards <laughs> with a slight application of foot pressure on the accelerator. You know, you're like, I'm sure this should go one way. And you try forwards, try reverse, try forwards, nothing's happening. I can just feel my face getting redder and redder, and I don't know what to do. And in the end, the instructor had to tell me what to do. He said, you've stuck the car against the curb. You need to rev it hard to get off the curb. It's like, OK, thank you. You know at this point you failed your test. <laughs> it's obvious. I was humiliated. I was completely red in the face. I was gutted. I knew I'd failed. I knew I couldn't afford a retest. It was horrible. But you know what happened? On the way back to the test center from there, I knew it's all over. The pressure's off. Drove flawlessly. I mean, I was driving for pride. It's all different then, isn't it? You're driving for pride. But it was a terrible first attempt. I did eventually pass on the fourth attempt, each time getting more nervous. But I just say, I feel your pain. It's fine. It's all right. Now, the thing was, every time I did it, I began to get more nervous. Think, How am I ever going to do this? And David had a similar sentiment, on with something a lot more important, granted. He says this in verse 12, how can I ever bring the ark of God to me? How can I ever do this? Look what happened last time. I thought, I thought we could do this, but look what happened. How can I ever bring the ark to me? For him, the reality of the holiness of God, the seriousness of the task he'd undertaken, it hit home and it looked perhaps like an impossibility. And as the ark was left at Obadidim's house, and there getting blessed, he was obviously doing something right. And we don't get any of the detail of what Obadidim did. Perhaps he just gave it the appropriate respect and distance. And actually, just let me say here, God loves to bless those who others think may be more expendable. Maybe those that others don't care about so much. God delights to bless them when they honor him, and they learn to do what others don't do. But for David, uh, three months it takes, but he goes again. He has this passion for the presence, and he will not just leave it and give up. So he has a second attempt to bring the presence central. And spoiler alert, this time it's more successful. We're going to read the account. We're just going to read a few verses from 1 Chronicles 15. And actually, if we can read this a little bit like a spot the difference, then we can see what is it that David did that made it successful second time round. This is 1 Chronicles 15. And we're going to read uh, from verse 1 to 4 to start with. I think it's coming up on the screen. It says, After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared a place for the ark of God, and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God because the Lord chose them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. David assembled all Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark to the Lord, to the place he had prepared for it. And he called together the descendants of Aaron and the Levites. Then verses 5 to 10, they list some of their names, some of the subdivisions of the Levites that they were part of. I'm not going to read all of those. Far too many difficult names. Um, verse 11, then we pick it up. Then David summoned Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, and Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab, the Levites. And he said to them, you're the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves. And bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. 
verses 16 to 27, they carry on. We get more detail about the musicians, the gatekeepers, the doorkeepers for the ark, and the thousands of people that are rejoicing. And verse 28 says, so all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouts, with the sounding of ram's horns and trumpets, of cymbals, the playing of lyres and harps. It worked. The ark is brought back. It was a successful day and no one died. If we were to read on into chapter 16, which we won't do for time, what ends up happening then is the rhythm of worship gets established in Jerusalem with priests and people worshiping and ministering before the Lord daily, his presence being honored daily. David has succeeded in putting God's presence central again in the life of the nation of Israel. This is a key point in the golden age of blessing that ensued for the nation. Did you spot the differences? You did, good, because they're important. And in them lie some keys for us to learn, some of the Old Testament keys about the presence of God that can still be powerful for us seeking to be kingdom bringers, bringing the presence central in our day, in our city, in our places of influence. You see, David was reinstating uh, principles and practices that had been ignored and forgotten under the rule of Saul, but that needed to be in place. We're gonna move quickly, but here's five things that David did or ensured happened that can be seen in these verses. Things that were needed to bring the present central, but that hadn't been attended to either the first time or by the previous leadership in the nation. First up, he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for us. It's what it tells us in 1 Chronicles 15. He made room. He practically had to clear some stuff out to make sure there was a place, there was relocation, reprioritization of what there was room for. Some things must have got downgraded to be moved out of the way to make a space for the tent in the city of David. There must have been time, must have been energy, thought, workers, but David prepared a place for the presence. He prepared a place. Number two, he inquired of the Lord. He asked God about it. He says this in the, in the verses we've just read, uh, 1 Chronicles 15, 13, about the first time he says, we did not inquire of him how to do it in the prescribed way. So this time he asked God. He didn't presume that his passion would be enough or that his faith would be enough or that his desire would be enough. He said, I need to ask God. I need to talk to God, inquire of God. He asked God to lead him. He prepared a place, he inquired of the Lord. Number three, he found out what God's word said. He did his homework about what was written down. We hear in verse 15 that the Levites carried the ark on poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. And if you go back and you read in Numbers 4, all the detail is there as to how it was to be carried. The first time they just hadn't read it. Nobody knew. Somehow it had been lost. So this time, David doesn't just ask God, but he goes and he either looks himself or has somebody do their homework. What does it say? What does it say in the word? And then, of course, number four, they did what the word said. Who knows, uh, knowing the word and doing the word are not the same things. I know this in my life. Um, but they found what the God, that God's word said, that there were some specific ways that the ark needed to be carried by the Levites, in fact, spe specifically by the Kohathites, not just any old Levite. And it had to be carried with poles on their shoulders. And there were ways they were to go about it. They were not to look at it. They were not to touch it with their hands because it was holy, because it was the presence of the holy God. But on the second attempt, they didn't just know the word, they did the word. They did what God's word said. And fifthly, they consecrated themselves. And it says this, verse 14, so the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord. To be consecrated is to be set apart, to be dedicated to something, sanctified or holy. For the priests and the Levites to be consecrated, there were, 
there were certain rituals they needed to go through. There was, there was washing of themselves. There was cleaning of clothes, removing of dirty garments and putting clean garments on. There were ceremonial offerings to be done to deal with their sin before they engaged with what was holy. You can read all about that in Numbers 8. You know, when the ark had first turned up at Abinadab's house 20 years previously, when you read about that in 1 Samuel, what happened was we get told that Eliezer, who was Abinadab's son, was consecrated to guard the ark. At that time, they understood there was some sort of being set apart that was needed. But when 20 years passed and they sought to move it on, I guess Eliezer must have passed away because he doesn't get mentioned. But two other sons, Uzzah and Ahio, take his place. But there's no talk of consecration. There's no attention to whether they're set apart. There's no attention to whether they're personally prepared. And we know and we've read how that ends. Consecration had got lost in the passing of a generation, in the familiarity of a household. And yet it was critical to bringing the presence central. David followed a generation where the presence had not been central. Saul had actually managed to be king for 20 years. He'd done the job, but in the absence of the presence or the blessing of God. And the ark had been abandoned at Abinadab's house throughout his entire reign. The inquiring of God by those in national leadership had been ignored. The written instructions of God had been forgotten. Obedience was considered unnecessary. And consecration was a lost practice. Some of that sounds scarily familiar. But Saul ended up rejected by God, insecure and paranoid, with the presence of the Holy God sidelined and the blessing that comes with it lost. Because, you know, you can't separate the blessing of God from his person and his presence. Blessing follows when we honor and we put the presence central. But David's actions to put the present central into the life of the nation provokes a further outpouring of blessing by God. He even sends the prophet Nathan to go and speak it over him. He's like, Nathan, go and say this stuff. I want to speak blessing over David. And stuff gets said over David and over David's offspring and over the nation as God is like, I love what you've done here. And it provokes his blessing. I wonder, Joshua, if you could come. You know, David was a man after God's own heart. And God's heart, his heart to dwell in the middle of his people has not changed. It hasn't changed. His desire is still to dwell in the middle of the people he's made, to save them and to bless them. Of course, the Old Testament picture of the ark is now replaced through the complete work of Christ on the cross and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit means he will now dwell in each one of us. We can have his presence central personally. As Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, our bodies can be temples of the Holy Spirit. And there's something about communities with Christ in the center. Paul writes this in Ephesians 2.22. He says, in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Building a church that is God's presence central. So how do we apply those five learnings that David learned to us personally? Well, it's not too hard with some of them, but five simple things for us to take away this morning. Number one, prepare a place. What do we need to do in our hearts and lives to mean that we can prepare a place for the presence of God? We may need to move some things. We may need to get rid of some things that are in the way. We may need to reprioritize. You know, so for most of us, there's some things we do that are time wasters. I don't mean the things you do that are restorative or restful. Those are important. But there's stuff we do that are time wasters. Lots of them are on our phones. Could we cut those back to make more room and prepare a place for God? Could we set our alarm five minutes, ten minutes earlier? Could we decide I'm not going to leave the house or I'm not going to go in my inbox until I've sat in the presence of God for at least five minutes at the start of the day? And many of you may do more than that, but if we're not doing that, 
could we start with that? What do we need to do to make a regular time and place to meet with God, to prepare a place for him? Number two, as it was for David, ask the Lord. Inquire of him, include him in the decision-making of your life before you act, before you make decisions. Are you thinking of changing jobs? Are you embarking on a new relationship? Are you moving house? Well, put the decision before him privately. Make the decision privately and just put it before him. So what do you think of this, Lord? Will you give me peace with this if I go with this? Let him direct you and lead you. It's what his presence is meant to do in our lives. But it doesn't work if we don't inquire of him. Ask the Lord, number two. Number three, know his word. I love the word of God. His life-giving word. It's been given to us so we can know this holy God that we're trying to know. He's not entirely like us, and this word helps us to understand him. It helps us to get him. It helps us to know what pleases him. We find these things out when we get to know his word. If you dislike reading, then listen to it. You can get it on your phone through version. You don't even have to read the words if you really dislike that. Although I would also challenge you, ask the Lord to give you a love for it and ask the Lord to help you read it because he will. Get to know it. It will help you to know him and help you in having his presence central. Number four, do it his way, whatever it is. Do it his way. You know, he made us. He is God, and he actually does know best. He blesses obedience, which is simply when we do stuff his way. So if he says to do it a certain way, let's do it that way, because it's better that way. And he's God, and he knows, and also he blesses it when that happens. So if he says sex works best inside marriage, guess what? Let's do it that way. If he says don't be yoked with an unbeliever, it's better that way. Let's do it that way. If he gives us other instructions about how we're going to interact with other people or instructions about forgiving or kindness, do you know what? It's better that way. Let's do it that way. But who knows it's not always easy to do it that way, yeah? Do it his way. It's not just the better way, but obedience makes room for the presence of God. It opens the door for his presence to be central. In fact, you could even say it's one of the key things that makes his presence central. Because we're saying, actually, it's not about what I would prefer. It's not about my reasoning. I'm going to step out of the center and say, Lord, you be central. I'm going to do it your way. Fifthly, finally, be set apart. Be set apart. Be dedicated to the Lord. Come to the cross of Jesus. Bring all your rubbish all your sin. Let him cleanse you. Let him forgive you. Let him make you clean and new. Let his Holy Spirit live in you and help you to live differently in a way that is set apart, that is dedicated for him. Not you doing it by yourself, but working with him in a way that is set apart for him. Being different in how you think, in how you reflect, in how you choose Different in your working and in your resting. Different in your responding. Different in your watching and in your doing. But live set apart for him, consecrated. It means to allow your body to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. A place prepared for him to dwell in. Because you can have his presence central and you can bring his presence central. Now, I know we're not kings like David was. I don't think we have any royalty in the room here this morning. Not many of us are exalted to that kind of position, but we are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. We are, as uh, Peter wrote, he said, we've been made a royal priesthood. We are priests who can carry the presence of God. And friends, we all have places that we go. We all have spheres of influence. We may not be the loudest voice in those places. We may not be the highest authority, but we can still carry something into those places, whether it's with your family or who you live with, who you share a house with, with your friends, our workplaces, our streets, our places of study, 
our children's schools, the places we do sport or where we do our shopping, all that stuff, wherever we go, could we bring his presence central into those places? Thank you, Pam. Amen. Can we bring his presence into those places? And you may not feel your position to make it central like David could, but could I just begin by stepping into those places and inviting his presence, acknowledging him? It's like, Lord, you're with me here and I welcome you here in this place. Could we take a step to bring his presence central? I think we could. And I think he's waiting for us to do just that. His heart has not changed a desire to dwell in the midst of his people. And although we may have a nation that looks way far from having his presence in the center, we don't have to give away a vision that perhaps he could do that again. He's a God who changes nations and his presence can do that. And I want to, as I conclude, just invite a simple response today. Whether you know personally that you need to make and put his presence central again, maybe that's just not been quite where you've been, or whether you know you want to carry his presence more into the places around you, the places you go, I'm simply inviting you to stand and respond right now. We're going to pray in just a moment. We're just going to simply stand to say, Lord, I want your presence to be central. I want it to be central in me, and I want to carry it to bring it central into the places where I go. in making your move, if it helps you to get out of your seat and come to the front, and some of you may feel you need to do that or want to do that, then please feel free to do so. But let's simply pray, position ourselves before the Lord, before we worship as part of our response. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your heart that is to be in the midst of your people and the length that you have gone to to dwell with us as rebellious and difficult as we make that. You keep coming after your people, and we thank you. We thank you that you is holy and mighty and beautiful and gracious. We thank you for your love for us and your presence in us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here right now and with each one of us. We thank you for Jesus, who has opened up the way for this, who deals with our sin. And now we say, Lord, would you help us? Would you increase our capacity to have your presence central? Would you help us to grow as carriers of your presence, priests who will take it into all the places that we go? Would you, Lord, anoint us afresh today with your Holy Spirit to be those who bring your kingdom presence and life to those around us? May we be those who carry something of your power and your peace and your love and your holiness and your manifest presence. We just pray, Lord, would you keep filling us as individuals and us as a body to overflow and to release your blessing into the world that you love. We ask in your precious name. Amen.